Ladies and gentlemen, as we know, the PlayStation 4 Orbis will be rearing its head soon. And so I'm going to be creating a video series that's going to be going through the PlayStation 3. In other words, what it's done right, what it's done wrong, um, its successes, its failures. And first thing we're going to do is create this video, which is going to be based upon the hardware of the system. We're going to be talking about what the actual system did right, what it did wrong and how I feel it could have improved it. Now, the PlayStation 3, when it was first released, as you guys know, was a pretty good system, to say the least. It was, of course, the only system out of that current generation that supported a Blu-ray drive, which turned out to be a very, very smart move on Sony's part. In terms of the actual specifications of the system, it used a cell or a microprocessor, which was made up of several cores. Now, it had one core that was 3.2 GHz and is basically a power PC based CPU processing unit, as well as six accessible synergistic processing elements. There's also a seventh, which is in a special mode, and that's dedicated only to the OS and security. And there's an eighth, which is to improve production yields, just to give you guys an idea of what that means. It basically means that as CPUs are made, occasionally there's a defect, so if one of the those um, SPEs is faulty, they've got one, they've got another one spare, is how it comes down to really. This is actually quite nice in one respect, as it basically allowed developers to know what they've got limits to, and they don't have to worry about, hey, if we take too much away, you know, in terms of take too much uh, resources away, it's going to crash the system, or it's going to cause the, you know, the, the operating system to run slowly, because one whole core is dedicated to this. Now, memory is a sore subject for me on the PlayStation 3, and in my opinion, one of the issues with the console is the amount of RAM it has. I've been very vocal of this previous in the past. The PS3 has two sets of memory. Now, we're going to talk about the first one, the general RAM first. That's 256 MB of a RAM bus XDR DRAM, and that's clocked at the CPU die speed. Now, only 256 is available for well, general purpose. Now, there's another 256 megabytes, and that's for GPU functions, graphics processing functions. We'll get into that a little bit later. Now, in my opinion, 256 as general purpose RAM wasn't really enough. Now, the Xbox 360 is also guilty of this. Um, 360, however, deals with memory a little bit differently. That's using um, unified memory. It's basically what it comes down to, and therefore the developers can split the memory however they want. Which one is the better one really depends upon the game. However, generally speaking, um, it turns out that the Xbox 360 does have a slightly better video quality, generally speaking, than the PS3. Now, speaking of graphics cards... This one was actually produced by NVIDIA, and it's co-developed between NVIDIA and Sony, to be exact. Now, back when uh, the PlayStation 3 was in early concepts and there were rumours going about, and this was what I was saying about the Orbis video the other day, about you can't ever really rely on uh, rumours to 100%, but it was rumoured that there were going to be multi-outs on the PlayStation 3. In other words, you were going to be able to output to two 1080p displays. Now, the purpose of this um, was to run games such as, say, Grand Theft Auto, uh, say, Gran Turismo, and so on, in a true widescreen and look very cool. However, there was a couple of reasons this didn't make it through, and one of them was just because outputting to 1080p with high quality is extremely difficult for the graphics card, and doing it for times two is even more taxing. However, let's talk for a moment about what the actual GPU is on this sucker. Now, it runs at 550 megahertz, and is based on a G71 chip. That turns out to be a NVIDIA 7800. However, just like Sony have done with the 17, 17970M, should I say from uh, AMD, the 7800 series chip for the uh, PS3 is also cut down. And how it's basically done that is lower the memory bandwidth and it has a lower amount of ROPs. And indeed, it's all the way down to what the 7600 had. Now, as I've mentioned before, it does have memory dedicated specifically to the graphics card, and this is 256 megabytes of GDDR3 RAM, and that's clocked at 700 megahertz. Now, this gives you a bandwidth of around 22.4 gigabytes. 
and it can read from the cell and XDR memory around 20 and it can write to it around 15 gigabytes per second. So you can see there's some data drop off there. The PlayStation 3 went with an OpenGL type of route and indeed is using PSGL, that's well, basically OpenGL ES 1.1 for anyone who cares. It also turns out that the PS3's graphics card is somewhat inferior, just in terms of design, to the Xbox 360. Now the Xbox 360 version, unsurprisingly, uses a derivative of DirectX, it's using DX9, and it's actually an AMD based card. Now while it's running a little bit slower, it's running 500 megahertz. It actually uh, supports more shade operations per second. It's the Xbox 360 one is running at around 96 billion shade operations per second, whereas the PS3s is around 75 billion, just under in fact. Now. To me, this was one area the PS3 definitely messed up in. Um, it wasn't bad. It's not like there's a night and day difference between the PS3 and Xbox 360. However, if you guys do some Googling around, um, you can find some sources which give you some indications of just what Xbox 360 versus PS3 games look like. And in particular, in the internal rendering resolution, you'll notice that certain games, Call of Duty for example, that including Black Ops 2 incidentally, that the PS3 actually runs the game at slightly lower internal resolution to the Xbox 360. That's just how it is. Generally speaking, the Xbox 360 also has a slightly better anti-aliasing or color fidelity. That isn't always the case, however, it does depend upon developers. For example, if you look, say, what the God of War uh, teams have done, or say Uncharted, obviously Naughty Dog, They've, they've pushed the console pretty darn hard, is how it comes down to. However, getting away from uh, that side of things for a moment, because I don't want to spend the whole video harping on about, you know, shader point operations and the actual amount of memory bandwidth the darn console had. What about overall? What things did it do right and where else did it go wrong? <clears throat> I think one thing that the PlayStation 3 did really, really well at the start was output. The fact it had HDMI out on the first run of consoles, I mean, the, the second you bought your console, it had HDMI on. That was a really smart move. Um, and obviously one of the reasons they did this was because of Blu-ray, which was in the console also. Now, HDMI out does look pretty darn awesome on the PS3. And indeed, it's worth noting that, in my opinion at least, Blu-ray looks absolutely fantastic on the system as well. So the fact it actually did support HDMI out, and this is completely contrary to the Xbox 360, which put it into later production run consoles. For example, when I first bought the Xbox 360 Core, uh, literally when it first came out in Europe, I only had the standard connection. There was no um, HDMI, which is a bit of a blow. Although, to be fair, my screens at the time didn't support it. I was actually running it through VGA, but that's a slight aside. The other thing that Sony definitely got right was the Blu-ray. Now, there are some issues with the Blu-ray on the system. One of them are, is simple. It can't read as fast as the Xbox 360's drive. It just simply doesn't have the data transfer rate. Now, that's one of the reasons why some PS3 games have mandatory installs on the hard disk, which is another thing I'm going to get into in a moment. The fact they actually had um, a Blu-ray drive, however, meant that for the most part, certain games could come on the PlayStation 3 system and the Xbox 360 could do them, but it would be over multiple discs, and there are certain games that pose a... Tr well, let's just go with pose a problem if they're over multiple discs. This is for numerous reasons, but mostly um, it doesn't really make sense to keep swapping between them. That's why now, of course, uh, certain games have some difficulty running on the systems, and it also means that you have to compress the data really heavily on the Xbox 360, which ironically enough does increase the loading times a little bit. However, also that also increases the CPU um, overhead a little bit on the 360 as well. However, the PS3 did do another thing right, and that was the hard disk. Now, in my opinion, it was a bit, well, it was a bit of a miser on some of the hard disk sizes. And indeed, on the first generation of systems, there's only a 20 gigabyte model, if you so wish. Now, obviously, this was cheaper, but, well, I don't think any of the systems should have gone with 20 gigabytes. Now, admittedly, the, P the Xbox 360 didn't even have a hard drive as standard, 
and even the premium systems only had 20 gigabytes but in my opinion the 60 gigabytes should have been the minimum now the good thing is at least with the you know ps3 in particular on the earlier systems it was really easy to change the hard disk really easy indeed and that was a really positive thing in my opinion the fact that you could change the hard disk with pretty much anything and that was certainly not really the case with the xbox 360 it also did a number of other things right as well. Uh, one of those would be Wi-Fi built in. Now, admittedly, later revisions of the Xbox 360 did include this stuff, and I'm sure I'm going to get a few comments saying it does, uh, you know, now support that. However, we're talking about actually on launch, and in my opinion, it was a really good thing that the Xbox 360, sorry, the PlayStation 3 did do this. It was, it kind of set the stage. It did also, ironically enough, hurt the system in one respect and that was that it boosted the price up a little bit and that meant that some people were somewhat more reluctant to get hold of the system. Another ironic thing was the PlayStation 3 was also a bit harder to program for and indeed a lot of Xbox 360 fans back before the PlayStation 3 was really kind of getting in there you guys might have heard of someone called Gabe Newell, I'm pretty sure you have, and obviously he is the man in charge at Valve, and he's obviously there responsible for systems like, or games like Half-Life, Counter-Strike, and so forth, and of course the prolific Steam on the PC, and Gabe actually said, and I quote, the PS3 is a disaster. Indeed, to continue the quote, he said, The PS3 is a total disaster on many levels. I think it's really clear that Sony lost track of what customers and what developers wanted. I'd say even at this late date, they should just cancel it and do a do-over. I'd just say, this was a horrible disaster and we're sorry and we're going to stop selling this and stop trying to convince people to develop for it. Bear in mind that Gabe is extremely vocal and he's also called Windows 8 a catastrophe as well. So he's not a man to mince words. As it turns out, of course, p programmers or developers, should I say, did get used to the hardware. And it turns out while it was a bit trickier to program for, it certainly wasn't a disaster. And indeed, the PlayStation 3 has actually done extremely well for itself. Uh, what about the online side of things? Well, I'm going to get into this in a separate video in a more detail. But in my opinion, Sony's PSN infrastructure, when it was first released especially, was a bit weak. It did improve this somewhat. And I have to say that I'm extremely impressed with certain aspects of the PS3's experience now. It, it, has, it has made marked improvements. I also will say that I'm quite a big fan of the joypads in the PlayStation 3. Um, indeed, there is a way of even getting them working on the PC, although that requires a bit of fiddling around. But the actual joypads themselves work really well. I find them light. They can be a bit of a pain with certain games, I find. And while some people may criticise Sony for, say, no, no rumble at the start, and even just sticking completely and utterly with the PlayStation design, well as good as what they did anyway. I have to say that I was pretty happy with the darn thing. It charges pretty quickly. It is comfortable. Uh, a little bit small for my hands maybe because I have pretty big hands. But other than that, it, it works quite well. I find the shoulder buttons can be a bit uncomfortable occasionally. But that's just my personal opinion. Also, as a slight digression, just the way the system's been put together, there have been a couple of joysticks, for example the Mad Cat's PS3 stick, that doesn't, that doesn't I'm sorry, work so well with certain versions of PC graphics, uh, sorry, PC uh, USB chips and so on. However, that's not really to do with Sony, so I'm not really going to count that as a black mark against them or anything, that's just the way Mad Cat's designed it, unfortunately. So, yeah, technically speaking, the PlayStation 3 it's a mixed bag. It had some issues, m lack of memory, in my opinion. It could have maybe done a few slight alterations towards graphics, the graphics side of things. The CPU was a pretty good win for Sony. Um, it's a pretty darn powerful CPU. It maybe wasn't an incredible success. I think certain people, um, especially on some of the forums I was reading back in the day, you know, everyone expected the the cell CPU to be the CPU and 
you know, that's what we're going to be seeing from now on. Of course, that's not really exactly the case. Uh, certain ideas have definitely been carried on. However, the PlayStation 3 and Xbox 360 CPUs were pretty darn um, excellent, to be honest. They Both companies made a pretty good decision on them. Um, as far as I understand it, I'm not 100% on this. I have heard that one of the issues with programming for the PS3 is actually to do with the CPU. Um, just the way that the you have to dedicate certain threads to certain applications and tasks. However, I'm not that much... I haven't really looked into it that heavily, if I'm honest. So I'm not going to um, say that that's, you know... Um, 100% the reason I just actually thought of it now, hence the reason I haven't really researched it for the video. You know how these kind of things just kind of pop up into your noggin, so to speak. Anyway, um, yeah, I think this is just about going to do it for this particular video. Next video, we're going to be talking a lot about the software and various other bits and pieces to do with the system. Anyway, this has been a quite enjoyable video to do, actually. I like doing these analysis, as you guys might know. Anyway, I think that's about it for me, so... Oh, by the way, I have played around a little bit with the sound levels because certain people were complaining that my voice wasn't quite loud enough on that previous video. So I bumped them up a few um, notches, so to speak. Anyway, let me know what you think. So anyway, take care of yourselves. Bye for now and have a good day.